Okay, let's start. We have a minion, you can start. Okay, this week's parsha is called the Ada. Hashem says, to make sure Ben I appear, Tavram Yitzhak and Yaakov. This parsha is really a continuation of the previous parsha. And it's very important to understand the connection and the story that's going on here. Meshe Rabbeinu was sent Hashem to tell Pari to take the Jews, let the Jews out of Egypt. Pari refused. Not only did he refuse, he made life more difficult for the Jews. Then they had to create their own straw and their own things. They weren't able uh, just to take it from Pari. So Meshe Rabbeinu, at the end of last week's parsha, comes back to Hashem and he said, Lam Vayashem Meshe Hashem Meshe Rabbeinu comes back to Hashem. And he says, hey God, why are you doing so bad things to these people? And why did you send me? And then he says, from the time I have come to power to speak with your name, you only made it worse. Okay? Reish Rebbeinu is typical Jewing and telling Hashem, what are you doing? You told me that you sent me to the Jews to take them out of Mitzrayim. Not only am I not taking them out of Mitzrayim, but you're even making the situation worse. So Hashem says to Mesh, in the last part, the last week, Pasha, okay, you're going to see the miracles I'm going to do. Now Hashem starts off this Pasha. Elokim, as Rashi explains, is severity. Havaya, I mean, Hashem is Rachman, is mercy. Elokim is severity. And he says, He says, you know, Hashem mentions Avraham Avinu. He says to him, what are you talking about? I reveal myself. Listen to this. Tavram Yitzchok and Yaakov, not with the name Yitzchok and Yaakov, not with the essential name of Hashem. I ne- Ushmi Hashem and I never told him my real name, like I'm telling you, Yitzchok and Yaakov. So what happened? As Rashi explains, Hashem basically is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, I miss Tavram Yitzchok and Yaakov. Chaval al di abdin dolei mishtakten. That's the expression. I miss Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov. I told them things didn't make sense. They never complained. I tell Avram Avinu, you're going to have kids. And then I tell him, bring them up and kill them. He didn't ask me, what are you doing? You, you, you made it worse. You make up your mind. You, you know. I told Yitzchok things. I told Yaakov things. They never complained. All of a sudden, you make sure I complaining. So there's a few things that we need to understand. First of all, the Pasik says a very interesting statement. I revealed myself to Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov. And Rashi says, who is that? To the patriarchs. Everybody knows Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov are the patriarchs. What is Rashi saying over here? The Pasik says, I revealed myself to Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. It comes along Rashi and says, you know who Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov? Are the Ovis, the patriarchs. Everybody knows that. What is Rashi telling me over here? Secondly, why is the name of the Pasha Va'eda? Va'eda means I appeared, vision, seeing. Va'eda means I I've, I've made myself seen to Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. But Eda is an expression of the ear. Why is the whole Pasha called the ear? And there's a very interesting thing going on over here. And, and I'm going to preface it with another question. Moshe Rabbeinu was greater than the others. We know that. Moshe Rabbeinu was greater than Abraham Yitzchok and Yaakov. It was a higher level of Kedusha. He got the Torah, they didn't. Meshe, Hashem spoke to Meshe Rabbeinu face to face, not like the others. Why did Meshe Rabbeinu ask and the others didn't? Why take it? Did the others not question God and Meshe Rabbeinu question God? And not only that, we learned already a rule in Torah. Hashem doesn't even speak bad about animals. The Gnus Behema Tmea, the Torah doesn't even speak about negative about an impure animal. Why in the world is the Torah speaking bad about Meshe Rabbeinu? 
Meshe Rabbeinu asked a question to Hashem. He questioned, like everybody else does. God, why did you do it? You're making it worse. What are you doing? He's screaming at God, what are you doing? And Hashem says to him, you know what? Be quiet. I miss Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. They never questioned me. Why are you questioning me? So the question why did he question that? Are you supposed to question God or are you not supposed to question God? And if Meshach Rabbeinu did something wrong by questioning God, why is the complaint left in Taita? Seemingly, it's something negative against Meshach Rabbeinu. That Meshach Rabbeinu is complaining to Hashem. To the extent Hashem spoke Elohim, Hashem spoke harshly with him. Why are you asking questions when the obvious thing? So if it's something bad, take it out of the book. But the answer is as follows. There is intellect and there are midas. There are emotions and there, are in, there is intellect. We know, Siddhis so explains and it's all over Medrashim and Avram, Yitzchok and Yaakov represent Chesed, Gevura and Teferis. Avram Avinu, the Torah called Avram Ayahavi. Avram Avinu was a level of Chesed Ava. Yitzchak, as the Torah says, Pachad Yitzchak, the awe and the fear of Yitzchak. Yitzchak served Hashem with Gvura, with severity. Yaakov, Midas Teferis, Midas Rachamim, is a combination of Avram and Yitzchak. Avram was unlimited Chesed, no good. Yishmol came from him. Yitzchak was unlimited gvura, no good, and Esav came from him. Yaakov Avinu, the Gemara says, which is a combination, a combination of chesed and gvura, of love and fear, mitos shreim, all his kids with tzaddikim. Chesedis explains, the others didn't complain because that's not their union of understanding. Midas are feelings. Feelings don't have intellect. Meshe Rabbeinu, on the other hand, so Avram Yitzchok and Yaakov were chesed of Atzilis, gvur of Atzilis, fetus of Atzilis. Meshe Rabbeinu is a level of Torah, Seichu. Meshe Rabbeinu is chokhm of Atzilis. V'nach numa, Chesedis explains, Meshe Rabbeinu is a level of chokhm of Atzilis. What does this mean? Mesh Rabbeinu, because he was wisdom, understanding, understanding needs to question. Not only does it need to question, it needs to argue, because that's what Seichel is all about, to argue when things are not doing proper, being done properly. So what did Hashem answer? Hashem answered Mesh Rabbeinu, you want to understand there's a level of va'eda. Va'eda means you have to see. You don't need to understand. There's seeing, re'iya, ru'uvein, like we learned, and there's shimin, which is listening, which means understanding. Meshe Rabbeinu comes back because that's his level of kedusha, to understand Meshe Rabbeinu coming to Hashem and said, what in the world are you doing? How can you do this, what you're doing? It doesn't make sense. So Hashem says, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Because you want to understand. But there's something deeper than understanding. And that is seeing. The Gemara says, we say it in our Yom Kippur Davani. When the ten Haruge, Asar Haruge Malchus, the ten martyrs that were killed in the time of the destruction of the Migdos, Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Shem Gamil, all the great ten martyrs that were killed. So the Yidin didn't know if, if this is supposed to happen. So it, in fact, it became a song, a very famous song. And we say it in the Yom Kippur davening, in the, in the, in the Aveda. Tia Rabbi Shmuel Asatzmei, Rabbi Yeshua purified himself. Kain Gadol, Rabbi Shmuel Kain Gadol. He purified himself and he went up to heaven and he asked God, what in the world is going over there? What's going on? And according to one Medrish, Hashem said to them, 
and this is pretty sharp, Hashem answered. Strike, be quiet. If this is what my mind entered, you don't need to understand it. Be quiet and stop asking me questions. Accept it for what it is. Meshe Rabbeinu comes along and is asking a question, a very legitimate question. You're telling me to take the Jews out of Egypt to make their life easier, and what are you doing? You're making it difficult. Meshe Rabbeinu says, it doesn't make sense. Lama it's a good question. But Hashem says to him, Va'era elavis. It needs to be seen, not understood. Seeing is above understanding. Seeing is when you become one with the thing you see, whether you understand it or not, it doesn't negate from what you saw. Understanding, you can prove to me I don't understand it. If I saw it, it doesn't matter what you explain to me. It doesn't, I see it. But the Torah here is saying an unbelievable thing. Hashem, why is it left in Torah? And this is a remarkable, remarkable lesson what Hashem actually wants from us. Hashem says, I want you to question why I do things. When Meshe Ben comes to Hashem, it says, why are you doing back to this nation? It's a Torah question. It's a question of Torah. Meaning, Hashem says to us, I want you to Ask me, why am I doing what? Why I do the Holocaust? Why do I do this? Why am I doing that? Hashem says, ask me those questions. It's a Torah question on one condition. That it doesn't hinder or affect the way you do Torah mitzvahs. In other words, you need to ask the question, why? And the Rebbe said many times, Hashem wants a Jew to scream at Hashem, why are you keeping the Jews in Golas? Why did you do the Holocaust? Why are you doing all these terrible things to the Jewish people? Hashem wants the Jew to ask, providing that it doesn't hinder our observance of Taylor Mitzvah. And that's one of the reasons why the Pasuk says, Bo'era el ha'aves. From one side, the others didn't question. Why does Rashi say that Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov Ella Ovis, we know who they are? There's an interesting that some Sefer says, <clears throat> Ova, Ovis, Av, comes to the word, there's a passage that says, Ova Hashem Hashkisacha. There's a bunch of times in Torah, the Torah uses the word Ova Alevese, which means actually he wants. Loy Ava means Hashem doesn't want. Ava Aves, the Chsam Sefer says, means the word Ava wanting. The Eira El Aves Rashi is telling us according to the way Chsam Sefer learns that Hashem is telling us the Aves wanted me to appear to them. Not like you, Meshir Abeinu, that said, Why are you coming to me? Send somebody else. You know, this is too much for me. Obvious because the obvious Rashi says, why did he say, why does Rashi have the obvious? Because he's actually speaking to the obvious that wanted him. But the Rebbe explains it a little bit deeper. We, we mentioned this many times in, in learning Pirkei Ovis. Sometimes the Mishnah says, Avraham, the Mishnah, the 10 miracles, 10 tests, says Avraham. Sometimes in Pirkei Avis, it says Avram Avinu. Moshe, the Mishnah says, there are 10 generations from Noyach to Avram. It doesn't say Avram Avinu. Sometimes the Mishnah says, Avram Avinu had 10 tests. Why sometimes does it say Avinu and sometimes not? So the Rebbe explains, and it applies here also. I mean, the Rebbe explains on the Pasuk also. When we say Avram Avinu, if he's our father, that means we have the ability to do what they did. We have that ability. 
Somebody can come along and say, Va'eda el Avram el Yitzchok vel Yaakov. Okay, what do you want from me? Avram was great, Yitzchok was great, Yaakov was great. What do you expect me to, to not question God? How do you expect me? Now, I'm not great like them. They, they were tzaddik and they accepted blind faith. But to me, how do you expect me, who's a simple Jew, not to question Hashem? That's why Rashi's adding over here, it's not Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov as individual people. El Ha'avis, they're our fathers. And if they're our fathers, we could do it also, because a son inherits the father. A child inherits the parents. And therefore, the Pasik is teaching us. There's a dichotomy over here. From one side, from one side, a Jew has an obligation to complain and ask God, what are you doing? Like Rosh Hashanah, you have to do it. To the opposite side, when it comes to action, we have to accept what God does. And it shouldn't lack, lack, lack off our belief in Hashem. It shouldn't hinder our observance of Torah mitzvahs because that's the uniqueness of the others. We need to ask or we not to ask. We need to ask to understand and scream why Hashem does things. But on the other side, we have to accept what Hashem does. And that's why the Parsha is called Bo'edo, because a Jew has to understand there's things we don't understand. In fact, we're learning Exodus this morning that the ultimate knowledge of a Jew is that to realize we don't understand. There's an expression of Exodus, Tachlis Hayidiya. The ultimate knowledge is Shaloy Neduach that we don't understand. And that's why Rashi says the law of it. Okay, that's one thing. Another very basic thing is a question a lot of Mephoshim ask, and there's a Hasidic insight to it. If you follow the Parsha, Hashem is telling Meshe Rabbeinu, I'm going to harden Pari's heart. He's not going to listen to you. And then I'm going to punish him. That's what it says. Go look at it. I'm going to harden his heart. He's not going to listen to you. And then I'm going to punish him for not listening to you. So uh, to translate this into a simple analogy, I tie your hands behind your back. And then I tell you to do something. You can't because I tied your hands behind your back. And then I beat you up because you didn't listen to me. That's not fair. Hashem says to Meshe Rabbeinu, I'm going to harden Pari's heart. He's not going to listen to you. And then he punishes him with the 10 plates. That's not fair. Hashem is fair. So some of Hashem answer, some of Hashem answer, that if you notice in the Chumash, at the first few Makis, it doesn't say Hashem hardened his heart. Initially, Hashem did not harden Pari's heart. Pari on his own stopped listening. So now Hashem said, oh, this is where you're going. So now I'm going to harden your heart and punish you. But initially, Hashem didn't start off with Pari hardening his heart. That's the simple answer many Mephoshim give. <clears throat> There is a phenomenal Hasidish explanation over, explanation over here <clears throat> that is relevant in many aspects in life. Hashem basically with Pari is teaching us. I'm going to harden his heart. He's not going to listen to you. And I'm going to punish him. Why? Because Hashem says, even when I don't let you do tshuva, you could do tshuva anyway. Even if I tell you I'm hardening your heart, you're not going to listen to me. Parai had the ability and the obligation to listen to Hashem anyway, because nothing stands in the way of tshuva. There's a famous story in the Gemara. Rameir had a famous rabbi there was, his name was Elisha ben Avuya. And later he became called, Ach, he was called Acher. <clears throat> Why was he called Acher? Because after a while, 
he became an apikaitis. He became a total apikaitis. Achen, Elisha ben Avuya, who's mentioned, by the way, in Pekei Ovis, he later became an apikaitis. And the, the Gemara tells a lot of stories that Amir still continued learning from him. And the, his colleagues asked him, how can you continue learning from Ache? He's an apikaitis. He's not teaching correct. And the mayor said, I'm great enough to eat the fruit and spit out the pits. Meaning, I know what is good, what he teaches, and I know what's bad, what he teaches. And I, I can handle it. And the Gemara tells a story. Ahed was not Meshem Shabbos anymore. He was riding a horse, smoking a cigarette on Shabbos. And the mayor was running after the horse, learning Torah from Ahed. Ahed still learned Torah. The mayor was learning... And finally, Acha turned to the mayor and said to him, Mayor, from the amount of steps my horse took, it's Tchum Shabbos. It's the you know limitation of 2,000 Amis outside the city. You're not allowed to continue anymore. So the mayor turned back and Acha continued. So the mayor tells the story. The mayor said to Acha, Rabbi Duchuva. Do tshuva. It was very close to the mayor. The mayor said, Rebbe, do tshuva. And Acher said to him, I would, but I can't. Why? Be, listen to this. This Apikaitis. He said, I heard a voice coming from heaven saying that everybody could do tshuva chutz mi Acher. Everybody could do tshuva except Acher. So he said to the mayor, why do you want me to do tshuva when Hashem said I can't? What was the problem? Acher didn't learn chassidus. That was his problem. If Acher learned chassidus, especially if he learned the Gersa tshuva of Tanya, he would have known that tshuva of a Jew is so powerful, unlike Pari's tshuva that we'll see about in a minute, the tshuva of a Jew is so powerful that even when Hashem himself says you can't, you could. Now, Trebbe says in the Gersa tshuva, there are certain Avedas that the Gemara says, a maspikim biyodi lasis tshuva. We don't give him the opportunity to do tshuva. God doesn't give him the opportunity to do tshuva. And Al Rebbe quotes him, Rabbi Noyen and others, that what the Gemara means is we don't help you do tshuva. Hashem normally, when a person comes to do tshuva, the Gemara says, if somebody comes to purify themselves, Messiah and I say, God helps him do tshuva. God helps those who help themselves. There's certain Avedas that a person does, it says, a maspikim biyodi lasis tshuva. We don't give him the opportunity to do tshuva. Says the Alter Rebbe Nigar Tshuva, avalim dochad v'nichnas, but if the guy still pushed his way, yeah, God's not helping you, and it's going to be very difficult. You can push your way through it, you could still do tshuva. And the Rebbe spoke, remember when the Rebbe spoke to Sicha, it was on a weekday, so we were out with a hookup. The Rebbe said, even though Hashem hardened Pari's heart, he would still be able to do tshuva. Even though Hashem said, you can't, I'm going to harden his heart, he's not going to listen to you. Pari had the ability to still listen to Hashem. And he chose not to. And for that, he was punished. If you wanted to take from this the unbelievable lesson that a person could take from this, that no matter how bad a person thinks they are, and they're so bad that they say, there's no way I could do tshuva, and nobody's going to help me do tshuva, you could still do tshuva. Because even when Hashem himself says, you can't, you could still do tshuva. 
And that's what happened with Rabbi Lazar ben Dadaya, the famous Rabbi Lazar ben Dadaya, when he said, mountains help me, ocean help me, land help me. It represents the, the Menami Prague is praying, it means the obvious, it means the rabbis, it means the guiders. The, the, everybody said, we can't help you. You fell so low, you can't help. You can't do tshuva. We can't help you. You're, so, you're gone. What did Ache do? He put his head between his knees. I mean, I mean, uh, Elisha Ben Avoy. I mean, no, Ben Dudai, I'm sorry. Elisha Ben Dudai. What did he do? He put his head between his knees and he did tshuva. He pushed in and did tshuva even when God himself said you can't. And what happened? Rabbi cried that the guy got all the in a minute. What does this mean for us? That never can a person give up from doing tshuva. To the extent, if Taita says you can, and Hashem says you can, you could still do it. Why is Hashem telling you you can't do tshuva? Why did Hashem care if Acha would do tshuva? Why did Hashem say everybody can do tshuva except Acha? Why? I mean, he's a nice guy. Let Acha do tshuva also. It's a big deal. Hashem is teaching us. I, what I really, my, by saying chutz mi Acha, that Acha can't, I'm really saying that he could because he has the ability to go against me. That's how powerful tshuva is in the power of the neshama, which is greater than Taita, greater than revelations of an Lukus in the world. A Jew could always do tshuva. It's a remarkable concept. That even Pari is to blame because he could still, he could have done tshuva. Okay, let's move on. Okay, Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim, today's parsha, Golos Mitzrayim, going out in Mitzrayim, is not stories that happened uh, three and a half thousand years ago. Everything in the story of Mitzrayim, the Golos Mitzrayim, the Makis of Mitzrayim, the whole story in Egypt, applies to every single one of us every single day. Why? We say in the Haggadah on Pesach, V'chol dar v'adar chayiv adam l'ir sesatzmei ki hilu yotzim in Mitzrayim. In every generation, a person has to appear to themselves as if they left went left went out of Egypt. Now, the Rebbe adds in Tanya, not only b'chol dar v'adar, b'chol yoyim v'yoyim, every day. By the way, it's not only every day. We say Lamantiskar, we say it in the after Davening is the Sheikh Shidas. Lamantiskar as Yem Tseisha Me'erit Mitzrayim Kol Yeme Chayacha. You have to remember the going out of Mitzrayim every day of your life, the whole day of your life. A Jew constantly has to go out of Mitzrayim. If a Jew constantly 24 7 for 120 years, a Jew needs to go out of Mitzrayim. So what that means is every aspect of the going down to Mitzrayim, the Bacchus of Mitzrayim, the plagues, everything is relevant to us on a daily basis. Okay? Now, when it comes to the plagues, the Pasuk says two things. Number one, to punish the Egyptians, and the Jews should know that I am God. That the Jews should know I am God. And I care about them. Therefore, the Makais, the ten plagues, were basically created to break the evil of Egypt. And if you notice, when Hashem told Meshach Rabbeinu to do things, he told Meshach Rabbeinu, take your mate, take your staff, right? hit the Yam or the, yeah, the Yam Suf or the Nile, whatever it was, all the markets hit the ground. Hashem told them, take your Mata and hit the Yam, the, 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 the Nile, hit the ground. What does that mean? In Hebrew, the Jews are called Shvatim and the Jews are called Mates. In the beginning of Parshas Mates, Vaydaber Moshe or Rashi Mates, Moshe Ben spoke to the Mate Echad, Mate Echad. 
Yet we know they're called Yud Be Shvatim. The month of Shvat is coming up, by the way. What's the difference between Mat and Shvat? Shevet. Shevet is actually a stick. What's the difference in Lush and Kedish in Hebrew, in Biblical Hebrew, between Mata and Shevet? Mata means a dried out stick that's very hard. Shevet is a, 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 a it's, it's moist, it's still a moist branch. Both are pieces of wood. Mata means a hard stuff, and Shevet means a soft stuff. And that's why the Jews are sometimes called mates and sometimes they're called shvatim. But let, let's discuss this and, and as far as our parish is concerned. Hashem says to Meshe Beinu, take the mate and hit Egypt, smite Egypt. A Jew needs to know two things. If you want to go out of Egypt, you want to go out of your limitations. Again, Mitzrayim means limitations, boundaries. And by the way, Mitzrayim doesn't only mean evil boundaries, you know, exile, sinning. There is a Mitzrayim of Kedusha, any limitation of boundaries, even of holiness, is called Mitzrayim. If somebody learns 10 minutes a day, every day, it's a very good thing, learning 10 minutes a day, every day. Bottom line is, you are in Mitzrayim. You are in a limited learning of 10 minutes a day. You want to go out of Egypt? You have to learn 11 minutes a day. You have to break your nature. You get used to learning 11 minutes a day. It becomes your nature. So now you got to learn 12 minutes a day. You give X amount of money to tzedakah. That was good yesterday. That's your nature. Give X amount. You have to give a little bit more. An extra penny. You have to break your nature. There is Mitzrayim of evil and there is Mitzrayim of Kedusha. The Mitzrayim of Kedusha, relatively speaking, is called Mitzrayim. It's not good. Status quo is not good. A person every day has to grow and become better and smarter and greater and, and so on. So there's two purposes of the, of the plagues, of hitting Egypt. One is to break the evil that we have within us, break that hard, harsh coarseness of evil or limitations. And from the second side of it, that the Jews should know that God is God and that he's taking us out of Egypt, which means as follows. Let's analyze the first two plates. Dam, Blood and Tzvadeya, frogs. Okay? And here, by the way, in passing, there's a remarkable lesson over here. Just in passing. Hashem said to Meisha, tell Aaron to take your stick and hit the Nile. He didn't tell Meisha Rabbeinu to hit the Nile. He told Aaron to hit the Nile. It came to the next place, plague of frogs. It says... Hashem said to Meisha, tell Aaron, take your stack, stick, stick and hit the, hit the, the, the water and the land and so on for the, for the plague of Svarbim. Kinim, again, hit the earth. Why? Rashi brings out a phenomenal lesson. Rashi says because the Nile protected Meisha Rabbeinu when his mother put him in the basket. And if the Nile protected Meshe Rabbeinu, it's not proper for Meshe Rabbeinu to hit the Nile to destroy the Egyptian. If Meshe Rabbeinu had earth when he buried the Egyptian that he killed who was beating up a Jew, when Meshe Rabbeinu killed him and he buried him in the sand, the earth protected Meshe Rabbeinu? Hashem says, Meshe Rabbeinu cannot hit the Nile and he cannot hit the earth. Aaron has to do it. Why? I, it's, the Nile has no feelings. The earth has no feelings. It's an inanimate object. What's going on over here? Why? Who cares? Hashem teaches us a lesson. Somebody did good something, something good for you, even if it's an object. Not a, how much more so a person. You know what you need to do? You need to be 
appreciative of what they did for you to the extent that the now should not be hit by Meshe Rabbeinu. The, the earth should not be hit by Meshe Rabbeinu for the first few plagues. Why? Because they did something good for Meshe Rabbeinu, small for Meshe Rabbeinu to do it. We have to be what's called appreciative. To be makir teiv. To appreciate the good that somebody does for us. Anyway, so let's talk about, again, we don't have enough time to talk all the plagues and there's other things I want to mention. The first plague is dam. <clears throat> blood. What happened? Hashem took the water of the Nile and turned it into blood. Okay? Now, the obvious question is, if Hashem wanted to make the drinking water not usable, why didn't he just dry it up? Why didn't Hashem, I once mentioned a show, it was 30, close to 40 years ago, where I was speaking, partially, I'll never forget this. I said, I asked the question, what you, why did Hashem turn it into dam? Let him turn it, so the guy screamed out, let him turn it into mashke, turn it into whiskey. Why did Hashem turn the water into dam, into blood? Because this is the Aved of a Jew in Mitzrayim, to go out of Mitzrayim. Water is cold. Water is cold. Blood is life and warmth. Because water is cold represents the coldness to Yiddishkeit. When a person is cold, yeah, he'll do mitzvahs. He'll do it. But you know what? Get rid of it. Let me get, get it over with. That's called coldness in mitzvahs. Hashem says to us, to all of us, you want to go out of your Egypt? You have to know one thing. Warm up. Get enthusiastic about your Yiddishkeit. You have to get enthusiastic about the Yiddishkeit. There's a famous story which was mentioned a long while ago. But there's a story told that the students of the Rosh Hashem were once walking to the Rebbe, the Bosham in the winter. And they came by a river and it was froze up. The river was frozen. And they saw an interesting sight. They saw the Goyim of the village were cutting across out of the river, out of the ice, to bring back to their city square for their holiday. They were actually cutting across out of the ice, bringing it to their, back to the city. So the students of the Baal Shem Tev said, we know that the Baal Shem Tev taught us whatever we see or hear is a lesson in serving Hashem. What lesson do we have from seeing the non-Jews cutting across out of the water, out of the ice? What do we learn from it? And one of them realized a profound statement. Water in itself is life. Yehem Chayenu. Mayim represents Taira. Mayim represents nourishment. But when is water water? When there flows, when there's life in it, when there's blood, when it becomes blood that flows and is warm and gives life and sustenance. They said the students of the Baal if the water becomes cold, Yiddish guy becomes frozen, it is so bad, you can even cut a cross out of it. You can even cut a cross of a desara out of frozen Yiddishkeit. So Hashem says the first thing we need to do is to get enthusiasm to turn the cold, transform the coldness of our Yiddishkeit to warmth and enthusiasm and to make it our life, our blood. It's our blood. That's first plague. Then Hashem brings the second plague. What's the second plague? Svardaya. What's frogs? Frogs come from the river. And the trader says, where did the frogs go to? The frogs went into the ovens. Tanurecha, they went into the ovens. Why did the, why did the Svardaya have to go into the ovens? And the Medrash says, by the way, 
It's the frogs know they're going to get killed in the oven. It's a burning oven. They're going to get killed. But to do the will of Hashem, they were willing to give up their life to go do the will of Hashem. That's what they did. What's the lesson for us? The ovens represent the ovens of Egypt. Tanurecho. The ovens of Egypt represents the heat and the enthusiasm of evil. The enthusiasm of evil is called the ovens of the Jew. It's of Mitzrayim. So this is when we have in our bodies, in our Mitzrayim, in our body, we have the warmth and enthusiasm to evil. Hashem says, you want to go out of Egypt? You have to take the cold Svardaya to go into the ovens to cool it down. It actually has to cool down the warmth and enthusiasm, just the opposite of Dam. Dam is taking coldness to Yiddishkeit and make it warm. And Tzvardaya, the next plague, is to take the warmth and enthusiasm of evil and cool it down. And as the Rebbe explains in the Sicha, these are the two levels, Sur Taking the blood, the water, I mean, into blood is Asei Taif. You're doing good. What does it mean, Torah enthusiasm? What does it mean, enthusiastic Torah? So the Rebbe explains. You do a mitzvah better than you should, better than you, you can get away with. We're trying to make it better, not worse. We're not trying to get out of mitzvahs. We're trying to get into mitzvahs. The more, the merrier, instead of the less, the better. That's the first thing. I say to you, make your coldness, make it into Yiddishkeit. Then you have a second level. Take the enthusiasm of, of world and cool it down with the frog. This is the way a Jew is going to go out of Egypt. Okay. Next, it's getting late. Okay, but um, there's another thing we find in the parsha as follows. Meshur Rabbeinu said to Hashem, I can't speak. I can't talk. So Hashem said, okay, you speak the Pari, you speak the Pari, and Aaron will interpret it. And the Medrash says, what happened? Meshur Rabbeinu Rashi quotes in the Medrash, Meshe Rabbeinu came at each time and said the words of Hashem in Hebrew to Pari, who didn't know Hebrew, by the way. And then Aaron translated it to Pari to make him understand what we're talking about. So Aaron actually, Rashi says from the Medrash, Meshe Rabbeinu came to Pari and he said his speech in Hebrew. Okay, Pari didn't know Hebrew like we learned already before. It was one language Yosef knew that Pari didn't know. So Pari didn't know what Meish Rabbeinu was saying. And then Aaron Akain came and translated and made, Aaron, made Pari understand it. <clears throat> so the obvious question is, like, why? Why does, if Pari didn't understand it anyway, why is Pari, why does Meish Rabbeinu have to tell Pari? Let Aaron go and make the speech. Meish Rabbeinu couldn't speak. It says in the Medrash, the Meish Rabbeinu said to Hashem, I'm 80 years out of Egypt. I don't speak Egyptian well. Aaron was in Egypt his whole life. Let him speak. So by, by Hashem says, no problem. You speak to him in Lashon Kaidish. You speak to him what the words I told you to do. And then Aaron will interpret it. So the question, why do you need Meish to do it? And again, the explanation is, Meish Rabbeinu because he was one with Hashem, had to first break Pari. He had to speak to him in a language that Pari didn't know, to break him. And then Aaron then made him understand it. Because in order for Pari to be a vessel, to even hear what Hashem wanted him to hear, the ego and the haughtiness and the thinking that they're a God that Pari had, had to be broken. Who breaks that? Meshach Rabbeinu breaks it. 
there's a very interesting story. When the Rebbe Rashab first became Rebbe, he refused because he had an older brother, the Zalmanaran is known as the Raza. They were fighting. <laughs> Actually, the Rashab said he's older, he should be Rebbe. The Raza said, no, he's greater, he should be Rebbe. And this went on for many years. Finally, the Rebbe, the Shab, accepted to be Rebbe. In the earlier days after he became Rebbe, a Jew came, comes in to him and says, Rebbe, I have an issue, I have a problem, can you help me? The Rebbe Rashab said to him, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. I can't, sorry, goodbye, I can't help you. The Chassi goes out and he starts crying. He starts crying. He can't be helped. So the Raza sees this Chassid crying and he said, why are you crying? And the Chassid said to him, I have a major issue. I went into your brother, the Rebbe. I asked him for advice in a bracha and he said he can't help me. So I'm crying. So the Raza said, wait a minute. The Raza was the older brother. He goes into the Rebbe Rashab, his baby brother, not baby brother, younger brother, and he says to him, what is this with you? This is the way you're going to be a Rebbe? What do you mean you can't help them? Tell him, tell him a nice word, give him a bracha. Tell him something nice. What are you, what are you doing? How, like, how can you do such a thing to the Jew? And the Rebbe Rashab said, call him back. The Chassid came into the room. The Rebbe Rashab gave him a bracha. He went out and he was successful. That's the story. So the obvious question is, obviously the Rebbe Rashab was able to help him. And the proof is that he did. So what happened at the beginning and what changed? At the beginning, the Rebbe Rashab said, I can't help you. And then all of a sudden he could help him. Why? So the Rebbe explains, Another remarkable thing. In order to be get a bracha, you need to be a vessel for it. You need to make a vessel. Like the Tzemach Tzedek once explained, for a farmer, the biggest bracha is rain. But rain is only when you make a vessel. If you plant the field, then rain is a bracha. But if you don't make a keli, you don't do anything. A bracha, it's going to rain, it's worthless. You want a bracha, you need to be a keli. This chassid had a terrible situation. He came into the Rebbe Rashab. It's not that the Rebbe Rashab couldn't help him. The Rebbe Rashab, the Rebbe explains, saw that this person is not ready to be a vessel and a vehicle for this bracha. The Rebbe Rashab saw he's not ready. I can give him a bracha. It's going to be worth it. What did the Rebbe want to accomplish? Out of love, the Rebbe Rashab wanted that he should become a vessel for the bracha. How did he become a vessel? By walking out and crying and becoming a broken person? That's what made him a vessel for the bracha of the Rebbe Rashab. Mm -hmm. So when the Rebbe Rashab heard that this person became the keli, the vessel, the Rebbe Rashab said, call him back. Now I can give him a bracha because now it's going to work. When Meshe Rabbeinu came to Pari, Aaron Akoyen wouldn't have made Pari as a keli because Aaron Akoyen is an attribute of love. He loved everybody. Ava, like the Rebbe says, even if you have to be a mate, even if you, sometimes you have to be harsh, you need to be a stick, a, a, a strong stick, Staff that's dry and strong, but it has to be Mata Aaron, it has to be the staff of Aaron, it has to be done with love. So Hashem says, Listen, Meshem, this is the way we're going to do it. You are going to go to Pari and tell him exactly what I told you in Lashon Kaidish, even though he doesn't understand, but that's going to break him. And then Aaron will tell him to penetrate. And even then, by the way, all the times. When Pari said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it was fake tshuva. He never meant it. And the proof of it is a second lady changed his mind. 
The second the plague stopped, he changed his mind. That's the opposite of the tshuva that we spoke about before. Tshuva, nothing stands in the way of tshuva. Even if the Hashem hardens your heart, a Jew could do tshuva. Paris tshuva was fake tshuva. He never meant it. Okay, another uh, interesting point. At the beginning, when when Hashem sent Moshe Rabbeinu to you know to party initially before the markets began, so Meisha, Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, "If Pari doesn't listen to you." Take the stick, throw it on the floor in front of Paro, will be a snake. Like he did by the burning bush. Okay? So make sure the who comes to Pare. Pare, God says, let the Jews. I said, I don't know who this God is. So you died this Hashem, I don't know this God. I don't know how you came up. I don't know how it came. I'm not sending the Jews out. So make sure the wants to show him a miracle. So he throws down the stick, it becomes a snake. Pare, calls in his magicians, his witchcraft people, they did the same thing. And then the Pasik says something interesting. After they became back into sticks, Aaron's staff swallowed their staff. That's what the Pasik says. And Mashi says, Nest Besech Nest. It was a double miracle. Not only did it turn into a snake and back into a stick, but after it turned back into a stick, it actually, but Aaron staff swallowed their staff. What, what, what's the lesson here for us? What does it mean for us in going out of Mitzrayim? So it sounds like this. Why did the stick turn into a snake? In Tanakh, Pare. In Mitzrayim, is called Tanin Hagodol, the big snake. Pari is called in Klipa, a big snake. Why is the snake Klipa? Who caused the Eitzadas? Who caused the original sin? The snake. Snake symbolizes evil. They were the ones that initiated the whole Eitzadas problem. Okay? Now, Hashem wanted to show Pare, you see, you're a snake. Okay? You're a snake. So they say, you know what? We also have the power. We could also do it. Hashem wanted to show the Egyptians by iron stick swallowing up their stick. Hashem wanted to show them, the Egyptians, that yes, you can make a snake. Yes, you could do magic. But where do you get that power from? It comes from iron stick, stick that swallows up your stick. Meaning, don't think that the power you have in the evil of witchcraft and evil is your power. Hashem said, it's my power. You can't do anything on your own. Yeah, I gave you the ability to do witchcraft. But you have to understand, who gave you that ability to, to do witchcraft? Iron staff swallowed up their staff to show it's all from Arden, it's all from Kedusha. And therefore, you have to be the Mata to destroy Egypt. You need to be, but like we said before, it has to be Mata Arden when you want to hit somebody, um, <clears throat> figuratively speaking, or we want to even hit ourselves. We want to blame ourselves for things that we do wrong or bad. The trader says the staff is mata ad and it has to be full of love. You want to admonish somebody else? You want to hit them with a stick? Figuratively speaking, it has to be a stick of love. Not of anger, not of hate, not of revenge. It has to be a thing of love. <clears throat> Just one more last thing, which is another very interesting the Pasik says, Hashem said to Mesha, Kaved Leif Pare, Pare's heart literally means became heavy. Kaved means heavy. Heavy heart means he refused to listen. He refused to listen. So Hashem says to him, Kaved Leif Pare, 
Okay, it doesn't matter where the Pasik is. Um, okay. But Kavid Leif Pare actually means the heart will become heavy. That means he won't listen. Again, hardened, he won't listen. In the Zayar, it says that what does it mean, Kavid Leif Pare? Kavid in the human body is also the liver. Paris covered lay pare Paris heart became like liver. That's what that Zayar says. Covid lay pare Paris heart became liver. Now what is not chopped liver by the way? What does it mean? It's a beautiful interpretation. It says in the Zayar, we say this in in Tikkun Lashuos by the way. Does it say it? Flash leaten. It's brought over all over Chassidus. Flash leaten by Adam. There's three dominating organs in a person. Mayach, Lev, and Kaved. Mind, heart, and liver. What does this mean? So the exp simple explanation just of what the what the, the Medrash and Desire says, it means that there's the intellect, the emotions, and the lower parts of the person. The extremities of the person, which represents action for a certain extent. Now we know by a human being, the mind is supposed to control the heart, which is supposed to control the lower parts of the body. In fact, that's what the word melech, king, melech, elam, melech stands for, mayach, lev, and kaved. King, I mean, mind, heart, and liver. When you're in that order, the mind controls the heart, and the heart controls the lower parts of the body, then you're a melech, then you're a king. If the heart controls the mind, then you was called in Hebrew a lemach. A lemach means like a nebach, nebesh. Lemach is when the same letters as melech, but when the heart comes before the mind, meaning the heart controls the mind, that's no good. What does it mean over here? Paris heart became a liver. Instead of having the control of mind, heart, and then liver, his liver was like the, the his heart became like liver. It, it, it lowered itself into the lower parts of the body. It didn't even function like a heart anymore. So the Zaria says, COVID leif party doesn't only mean it became heavy, tichpad, heavy that he didn't listen. His heart actually lowered itself to the lower parts of the body instead of having feelings. It was only the lower parts of the body. And that's what Azariah says the definition of COVID leif pare, that the heart of pare actually turned into a liver. Anyway, time's up. So, Mirta uh, Shem, Wednesday night, we will have a class at eight o'clock. And Baruch Shem, tonight was worked. I apologize for Wednesday when it didn't work, but things happen. Everybody should have a very good week. And don't Amen. forget, uh, Thursday is Rosh Chodesh. Oh, which one's gonna end? Okay. Everybody have a great week. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.